Hello, good afternoon. Welcome to uh, the Estrel Suite, shortly to be renamed the Geek Theatre, I think, um, for the second session today about rebooting the TV experience. Today, we're going to look specifically around the social TV aspect, which you might have heard sort of touched on in the previous session, but I'm hoping with our panellists we're going to sort of delve into that a bit further. Um, my name's Mark Goodchild. I come from a, a linear, old-fashioned TV producing background, and I'm the moderator today, but in the, for the last decade or so, I've been uh, working in digital media around converged formats. So my interest has been very much coming from the producer's side. Um, and what we wanted to do in the next uh, hour is sort of reflect on what is social TV. Um, over the last 10 years, from my perspective, I've seen various things purporting to be making TV more social. Uh, if you look back around uh, 2005, six, there were lots of experiments with the red button, doing uh, chat on TV forums. Um, we had text to TV, uh, particularly on the late night uh, channels, which both people claim not to have watched, but m lots of people have seen. Um, and obviously lots of voting formats using different technologies. The thing that seems to have changed is that Social has become ubiquitous in other platforms, so social networking is sort of commonplace. The technologies to actually make it work with television seem to be getting closer. Um, and once again, there's a new term for it, uh, which is a buzz uh, going around this place. Doesn't necessarily mean the audience at home sort of equate uh, the same buzz around social TV. But this is just uh, taken from Google Trends this morning, looking at when did social TV first emerge as a, as a phenomenon. Um, and if you look at the chart, trying to work out, probably 2005 was around the time social networks started to kick off, or when Google Trends started monitoring this stuff. Um, there's a spike around this time last year, probably, because MIPCOM were probably talking about social TV. And then you've got various things in the last uh, uh, 12 months, which are uh, all about individual announcements. So. Like most other panels, we're probably going to be saying 2012 is the year social TV takes off. Um, so we'll be exploring that. I'm going to introduce our panellists uh, one by one at the top, and then I'm going to ask them to each talk uh, for five minutes about what they're doing in this space. Um, I asked them to tweet this morning what their actual job titles were, so to keep it short. Um, so right next to me, Patrice, uh, going back to old media in my notes here. Um, Patrice is... Uh, in charge of innovations uh, and communities at Orange. That means putting new products in the hands of users. But rather than just see the corporate stuff, we, I did a little bit of delving to find out what his social graph actually looks like. Um, and this is Patrice on uh, Twitter. Lovely hat. Um, not, not particularly prolific on, on Twitter, but you are tweeting today from the panel, I believe. Yeah. Um, this is him on LinkedIn. He's part of the 500 Plus Club. Uh, this is him on Facebook, and he loves Pavarotti and Radiohead. It's great what you can find out. And this is him on Google Plus. Didn't get very far, but I love the Darth Vader mask. Um, so next to him is, um, is Sean Besser, who is representing Rovi as Biz Dev and Data Acquisitions Head. Let's have a look what I found out about you. Also part of the 500 Plus mark. Um, lives in Santa Monica. Still not that prolific on Twitter. Not sure whether this is the Sean Besser or a different one, but you've got a closed uh, wedding, group of wedding photos. Uh, couldn't get into that. Um, and you're currently reading the corrections. Is that you or is that another Sean Besser? No, that's, that's okay, all me. Good. It's working. Um, next to him, and I'm glad to say we've got some women on the panel because it was turning into a real male geek fest earlier. Um, we've got uh, Carla uh, Becci. I uh, just want to pronounce it right, from Facebook Partnerships Organisation, working with broadcasters and producers to bring social to TV. Um, you'd expect her to have a really big uh, presence, being part of Facebook. This is what I found. That's her LinkedIn. 379 connections. Not doing very well. Um, <laughs> this is the only Carla Getchy I could find. <laughs> Not only is she on Twitter, she's also on Facebook. <laughs> And I think you've got to have a word with Mark Zuckerberg about that, because I think you can pull rank uh, to get, get your uh, profile up above hers. This is, um, this is unfair. Yeah, <laughs> I know. Moderator's prerogative. Um, and then this is the only thing I could find, which was about your music choices. This is going back a bit. Yeah. 
And then finally, last but not least, um, we've got uh, Claire Tavernier, who is head of digital and drama networks at Fremantle. She's been there, been there for a while, and she's a geek, and she loves TV, is what she tweeted to me. <laughs> and these are her presences on uh, the different media. And the most prolific tweeter of the lot. So I think she wins as queen of tweets. So I'm going to ask them each to come up one by one and uh, present for five minutes. Then we're going to have a conversation about the different themes that are emerging. So first of all, can I introduce uh, Patrice? Thanks. Um, is it working? Yeah, I can hear myself. What, what an audience. Well, um, I just want to, uh, to, to say a little things about um, TV check, which is probably the way we're going to uh, to add some uh, some elements, and I hope uh, we won't be able to agree on that and have an interesting discussion. Uh, I think that some of the people living in France already know TV check, but for for the rest of uh, of you, uh, can we have a, a little video? It's a very short one. I can comment what TV check is about. So it's uh, an iPhone app uh, currently, which is giving you the ability to check in. Uh, on the program and have an automatic recognition of the program you're watching on live TV. Uh, it's also a game uh, and it's a social thing that will tell you friends what you're currently watching and have the, the ability to, to comment that live. Uh, of course, we have brought in TV Check all the usual suspects you may have, such as badges you can win because you're watching a show or you're watching uh, different shows uh, connected together. Uh, we have uh, a game, and as all the games, we have the top uh, people in your network and in, in the games we are just competing to trying to be the master of a program, which is the equivalent of Foursquare now. So on TV Check, you can comment. Uh, it's uh, based on, on your Facebook community. Uh, we're not recreating a social network. We're simply using Facebook as a, a power plug uh, just in the wall. Uh, and it's also something seen from the uh, advertiser standpoint. It's also something that will allow uh, the, 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 the user to engage versus a show or even an advertisement which can go live. You, you, you can see here the, the Peugeot uh, ad campaign which is uh, live in France. And uh, we have the ability to uh, take in the application some little information about for instance, uh, Tintin and uh, the Peugeot uh, advertising, but also the ability to recognize automatically that you're checking in on uh, the ad while it's live on TV. And uh, when you've been able to say, OK, I've checked out, uh, you can validate that. And you can have this, uh, this information going live on your Facebook profile. Uh, and then uh, it entitles you to, uh, to have some kind of additional information. Perhaps you, you want to. Uh, review the ad, or you want to get extra info about the car you've just seen in the, in the advertisement. So as you see, it is something that uh, is trying to use social TV we've, we've not created. I hate all the buzz, buzzwords. Uh, we haven't been creating social TV or anything. We've just seen that people were interacting in front of the TV. So we try, we, we've tried to simplify the way they should interact. Uh, and on the other side, uh, we were thinking of something that uh, TV channels, broadcasters uh, would be able, uh, and producers would be able to take, to use as an engagement mechanism. And, uh, and in addition to that, we've seen that it was gaining some interest from the, the advertising space, uh, from the agencies, from the advertiser who were saying, OK, I think that what you're providing here is giving me a way uh, to, uh, to, to, to go from broadcast to unicast and to know that I'm not in front of 23% of uh, middle-aged mid -age, uh, uh, women uh, who like sports. Uh, I'm just in front of this particular lady uh, who has an iPhone, who's checking in, uh, and uh, who has some interest and who's expressing some interest for a particular show or a particular advertisement. OK, so we've seen a few TV check-in services sort of emerging, yep. the likes of Get Glue, et cetera. This is a telco play into that space. Is that because you need to get it further up upstream, or is this because you actually believe it sort of fits in with the rest of the stuff that you offer as a telco? You know, every, every time we do something, it's just, first of all, because we want to understand. 
So uh, as a matter of fact, internet is coming to, to TV as a guest. It's changing some of the things, some of the rules, and we want to understand simply because we're part of the chain. Right. After that, uh, let's say that we have thought that uh, we, we wanted to make it a little bit different by using the automatic recognition based on the, on the, on the visual fingerprint because we, we thought that in many places, especially what, what is happening when you're watching a show in France, everybody's commenting. And we didn't want to have everybody, uh, everybody saying, shut up, I'm checking in. Okay, so, so that's, we wanted something We visual. saw Shazam earlier. You, from a technology point of view, you, you, you're banking on video recognition. Yeah, that, that translates into a technological something. But uh, on the beginning, it's a user thing. Yeah. Uh, it, television is first visual and then talkative, and uh, this is why we, we focus on that. And, and social is a big part of that application? Uh, social is uh, probably one third of the application, and the other part is gaming, for sure, because uh, uh, it has to be fun, it has to be something with which you're, you're, you're doing uh, something which is funny and which is giving you some little piece of reward by, in, by for instance, being uh, invited to the show, getting some goodies, physical goodies, etc., from the real world. And the, the third part is, uh, is probably on the content discovery, which was discussed. I know uh, you've been uh, discussing that this morning. Because uh, as my boss, Xavier Couture, is always saying, it's so sad to watch TV alone. OK. Bringing in Sh Sean, um, Rovi have always been involved in sort of the, the, the metadata that powers EPGs, uh, discovery uh, systems, which uh, things like Best Buy, et cetera. Are you, you're now bringing social into that mix. Um, do you want to, to tell us a bit more about what Rovi are up to? Sure. Uh, do you have the clicker? Yeah. Great. So I head up uh, business development uh, strategy and uh, data acquisitions for Rovi. Uh, if you're not uh, sure exactly uh, who Rovi is, because a lot of people don't, because we're primarily a B2B company, uh, I can guarantee you, you probably access uh, or interact with Rovi multiple times every day. Uh, our, our key area of focus is powering the, the next generation of video discovery and engagement. And uh, we focus on giving tools to our customers to create content, uh, and enable the search and discovery, acquire, and of course, enjoy it. Uh, easiest way to talk about some of the core stuff that we do is really to talk about some of the companies we've bought over the last few years because we had found an, a lot of companies that were doing some interesting pieces of what we wanted to do uh, well, but uh, we combine them and, and uh, are, are trying to, do, to use them to complement each other to do everything well in a really comprehensive and unique way. So we bought Gemstar TV Guide uh, about four years ago. Uh, every, most everyone's familiar with them. They're the leader in on-screen television guidance. Uh, if you press the guide button on your remote control, odds are you're, inter you're interacting with, with us in some way because we power pretty much 100% of guides in the, in the US and the Western world. Uh, and the focus for us is revolutionizing the guide in two real fundamental ways. One, uh, increasing the suite of content that you can find through your guide. Uh, that means adding internet content, adding personal media, and extending that guide experience to any other device, uh, either viewing device or TV controlling device. And then the second real fundamental change is personalizing the experience more and doing a better job of, <coughs> excuse me, of figuring out who's holding the remote control or who's sitting in front of that screen and uh, pushing relevant content to them. Uh, this becomes increasingly critical in a world where you're, there's pretty much an endless amount of content that's at, at your fingertips. Uh, other major companies that we've bought over the, past, over the years include All Media Guide and Muse, which are both metadata companies. Uh, and metadata is really all the information about a show that, uh, or movie or piece, other piece of, of content that uh, ties everything together. It's the artists, it's the titles, it's the photos, it's the uh, trailer, the descriptions, et cetera. And it's all the information about a piece of content. And if you go onto virtually any site, major site that is uh, in, in the commerce business around digital media, odds are they're, they're using our metadata. This includes iTunes and Walmart and Tesco and Google. Uh, and Blockbuster and on and on and on and on. Uh, all of these companies use our data to power all of their digital media. That's their movies, their TV, their music, their books, their games, etc. cetera. We, we strongly believe that content curation is, is what's king. Uh, uh, it, it's, it's become critical that we, that 
we as uh, companies that are dealing uh, in the digital media space focus on figuring out how to get relevant content in front of people's eyes. There's, there's no absence of, of amount of content available to people. Pretty much everything is available online all the time, and usually legally, uh, but illegally as well, of course. Uh, uh, I believe it was uh, Google published a statistic that something like 50 hours of, of content gets uploaded every minute uh, to their site. And then legal sites, uh, the, the premium sites are constantly uh, adding more as well. But I, almost everything at this point is available. And so it's become critical that we do a better job of figuring out what people actually want to watch as opposed to just throwing the world of content at them. Our research has shown that 83% of people, when they click the guide button on their television, have absolutely no clue what they want to watch. That means seven out of every eight of you uh, don't know what you're interested in. What does that mean? Whoever is, is putting that guide out there or that experience or, or, or that website out to you has to do a much better job of figuring out what you really are interested in because the vast majority of people really come in clueless. You'll often know, hey, I want to watch a TV show because I've only got 20 minutes or 30 minutes, or I want to watch a movie because I'm looking for a couple hours. But beyond that, it, the, the, the world is, is there to, to, to be advertised to or connect with their social network to get recommendations of what they want to watch. Here are some of the ways some of uh, you know, our products help people engage with that. Uh, this is a, a, a movies portal on one of our guides. Uh, what we do is, is we have ver uh, ver various types of recommendations for people. It could be editorial, uh, it could be based on your social network, it could be algorithmic. Uh, uh, there's a variety of ways. Uh, this is an example of, of a movie details page and where metadata comes in. Everything you're seeing on that screen pretty much is the metadata. The, the box art, the synopsis, the title, the length, all of that. You can also see that uh, there's an ability to rate it and, and see what your friends have rated. Uh, so we've, as, a, as an example, we've integrated with Flickster. And so this, we feel strongly that social media and television need to converge in a meaningful way. It's not just about slapping your Facebook or Twitter page onto your TV and letting, letting, uh, letting the, the, the streams flow, because that doesn't work. TV is a shared experience. The last thing I want to do is, is sit and see my wife's Facebook updates when I'm watching uh, the, the, you know, a, a football match or something. Uh, it's about figuring out stuff that's relevant to you and, and, and using that as, as a launching point. Uh, the other area where we feel social media really uh, converges with TV is as, is as a second screen experience and using your iPad or your phone, iPhone or, or some other connected device in your hand to either engage with the social media or to use the social media to discover what next to watch on television. So in where you used to be a sort of a curated service and you've got lots of people crunching through I mean, loads of programs and then working out putting synopses in, you're now trying to pull in what people are actually saying on their own streams? Correct. So we still do curate a tremendous amount of content. We have about 400 people whose sole jobs that are mm -hmm. to watch television and movies, listen to music, uh, and, and create the core data. But we also work with uh, a tremendous num number of other sources for that data, whether it's getting rich media images from Getty or getting trailers from the studios or working with the Flicksters and the Facebooks and the Twitters of the world to, to index your social graph and use that as a, as a means to find relevant content. Uh, the, the, two most, uh, the two key areas for that are exactly knowing what your friends are watching. Uh, because that's a, a tremendous uh, uh, indicator of what you may be interested in checking out, as well as uh, seeing what people in your neighborhood, your neighborhood, so to speak, are watching. And it's people with similar uh, profiles to people you that like maybe me. aren't in your social network, but have the exact same type of viewing profile and seeing what they like is also a, a strong indicator. Perfect. Perfect chance to bring in then Carla. Uh, a couple of weeks ago, big announcements at the F8, which seemed to get crowded with quite a lot of different noise, but one of them was about Facebook opening up this notion of being able to real real time engagement with what your friends in other places are are, are consuming, whatever the media it is. Do you want to uh, explain what's going on there? Sure, sure. So, yes, yeah, so a week and a half ago um, at Facebook's F8 conference in San Francisco, um, attended by hundreds of developers and um, watched live in 19 countries uh, across the globe, first time um, that that happened. So I think it shows the truth kind of globalization that's happening around kind of social media, in particular Facebook. Um, we made a number of announcements, and I think uh, two that I want to talk about today, um, starting with um, a new type of user profile. 
which we call Timeline. And Timeline is a completely new way for people on Facebook to express themselves. And it's now making profile an actual destination for us all to go to. And what does that mean? Well, today, if you visit your friends on Facebook, um, you might uh, check out their photo albums or look at videos or wish them happy birthday on their wall. But it was fairly limited kind of interaction on, on such a large amount of real estate um, across you know, 800 million users. Um, and what Timeline is about is completely redefining self-expression for people on Facebook. And that really um, it kind of starts with a completely new class of apps. Um, and what's exciting is these, you know, the, the conversations that have already been kicked off here about how to socialize um, guides um, and how to use kind of TV check-in services to help us all discover kind of content through the lens of our friends, as it's always been done in the past, but today uh, is, is more important than ever, because that's a great stat, 83%. Um, don't know what they want to watch and have limited time to even uh, tune into television. So bringing social to the surface uh, to aid discovery is really, really valuable. And now all those services that have already been kind of cropping up and happening around um, using, for example, information about my likes um, on Facebook. So all of the films that I might have liked on IMDb or um, the music that I might have liked across the web, that information is, was already starting to power kind of these experiences to help um, like I said, surface to the top, uh, content that's relevant to me based on my friends. But a like is, again, a, a fairly limited kind of connection to make with, um, with anything. So what happened at F8 was the launch of um, custom actions, what they're called. But all that really means is allowing kind of developers to build experiences and apps that showcase what I'm watching in real time. So these apps represent actual activity based on real identity. Um, and that kind of changes the game for interaction um, across Facebook. Um, I have a short, I think short video that just illustrates what these new kind of class of apps will look like when Timeline actually comes out to, to 800 million users. Today, it's just available to developers on the platform, um, but it's coming very soon. So theoretically, and I know there have already been some announcements about the uh, collaboration with Spotify and Netflix in the States. Theoretically, if I'm a Netflix consumer, you're a Netflix consumer, we're friends, you can dip into what I'm watching live sure. at that time sure. through Facebook. Sure. Claire, uh, you're the representative of the producers on, on the panel. Um, <laughs> is this a game meaning we're all going to have to change the game of what we're making? And does it apply to everything we do in terms of content production? Um, you know, the funny thing about producers is the, the, the funny thing about television is that it's such a mass audience that we have the luxury of waiting for the geeks to do their thing and then decide whether we want to join the party or not. And that's kind of what happened in, with social media. I think, you know, it started three years ago and we're like, oh, look, there's this thing called Twitter and people are talking about our shows and Facebook. Oh, my God, they seem to like our programs. And then we, you know, we, we, we really thought about 
is this something we want to interfere with? Because to be honest, it's already benefiting a lot of our shows and Fremantle Media produces shows like The X Factor and Got Talent and Idol, which are very inherently social anyway. So we, we knew they were being discussed on Twitter. I mean, Susan Boyle, I think, was the, was the moment, because Susan Boyle, although it was on YouTube, you know, it was really, it became the success that it was because it was shared. It was shared enormously on Facebook. It was shared even more, I think, on Twitter even though Twitter was very small at the time. And that's great, you know, it's great, <laughs> fantastic. We, we, we sold the format to a lot of countries, it, it got record ratings, Susan Boyle sold a lot of CDs and we were quite happy. Um, and then we, we sort of, it, it took us a while to decide whether we, we should be doing anything. Because honestly, there's also a point where you know we're not gonna control that discussion because you don't want to, it's happening, it's emerging, that's fantastic, it, it, it can be very positive. Obviously when it becomes negative, you have to intervene. But uh, why do something? And then we thought about it and, and we've really sort of decided to look at it from three perspectives. For us, if we, I mean, we know social media is happening and it's happening around our shows and we're very pleased about it and we're not going to control it in any way unless there is any sort of legal reason to do so. But if we're going to do something with it, it has to meet three criteria. It has to either help us with the acquisition of new audiences or it has to help us um, with the retention of our audience or it has to help us monetize our audience. And it has to do one of the three things because otherwise, honestly, we should probably not be doing it. And the most obvious one actually was the retention in the sense that we, tr we translated that as saying, you know, let's try to see whether we can deepen the engagement with our shows through social media. And that's happening again, organically anyway, but we, we experimented with a lot of things from, from you know, um, the sort of having the social media editors on, around our shows and we have very different policies for fiction, for scripted, which we think, you know, where the interaction happens before and after the show and then for the live events, the, the sort of the talent shows where we have a very, you know, inherent interactivity during the show. So we've, we've made a lot of progress and I think we're doing some great things there. So that was all going well and then we looked at the other two, acquisition and, and monetization and they're a bit harder. Uh, I think discoverability in this sort of the sort of products that we've heard about will eventually help on acquisition. It, for us at the moment, social media helps us a lot for acquiring new audiences on smaller shows. To be honest, they're not going to bring a lot of new audiences to the X Factor, but they may well bring new audiences to Take Me Out, which is a smaller dating show that we have in the UK, or to um, some of the game shows. In fact, we've had a really great experience with Family Feud in the US, which has been on air for 35 years. So, you know, it's been there for a while, but nobody really watches it anymore. And we had a very successful YouTube channel around that, that, that show, and it became very viral, and it's been very, very popular again. The ratings have gone up. So acquisition, I think we're starting to get the hang of it, and I think there will be technology development that, that help us in that, in that sense, I hope. Uh, I hope they help us and not other producers. Uh, and then, the, but then where we are really, at the moment, uh, getting a bit stuck is on the monetization, to be honest. I mean, obviously, we're always happy when, when, when we sell more shows because they have a good social media buzz, but in terms of actually finding ways to um, make a profit out of that experience, I can't say that we've um, really found the holy grail yet. Okay, we'll come back to the monetization in a second. I just want to pick up on this sort of adding social to being this extra element of acquisition and choice. I think Anthony Rose suggested earlier that in the previous panel that no one wants a choice. Aren't we, by adding an extra social dimension, you know, if we've got 156 friends, adding 156 other things I've now got to wade through to work out what to watch? And will that inevitably just end to a real snacking culture rather than being able to sit down and watch something good each of you? Go on. I think, well, first of all, I think social recommendation, I mean, when I look for a builder now, I go on Facebook rather than go on Google because if my friend tells me this is a good okay. builder, it's, I've, I've got a much higher chance of, of <laughs> getting into show up in the morning. So, but the, then the same with television. If it's somebody that I trust to like the same programs that I like, likes a certain show, it's going to, that recommendation will rate much higher for me than, than just a TV guide magazine or, or something else. So I think it's not, you can't necessarily compare those recommendations and they won't all have the same weight as well. I think there are some very interesting sites developing like Hunch, which you know build 
whole social recommendation engines around around everything that you do in life, and and I think that's going to be a, a big trend. In terms of snacking, what we're seeing about social media, which is very positive for us, is that, is that in some ways it is bringing people back to television. There was a TV Guide study last year that said that 20% 20, 20 of people had stopped time shifting so much because they didn't want to get social spoilers. They didn't want people to tell them what happened on, on, on Twitter or Facebook. So the shared experience element of the television, uh, uh, which Patrice was talking about, is definitely one of the key drivers of, of that kind of behavior. And, and largely echoing that, I, I think people do want choice. Uh, I, I, and, and I think what Anthony was, was intending there is, and that I completely agree with is they don't want to be handed the entire universe of choice because that's just overwhelming and intimidating. It's about uh, uh, narrowing it down to relevant choices and saying, all right, we know who you are. We know what your history is. Here's your friends. Here's a handful of things uh, we think you're going to like, whoever the we is at that particular moment, and making it relevant, making it resonate uh, because it's critical that, that the, the content that gets presented to users is stuff that they're interested in so that they can choose from a more finite number of, of relevant content. Now, obviously, Rovi, most of your experience has been on the, on the big screen, getting the, the EPGs and the data mm -hmm. on the screen. This shift could, and particularly with the work that Facebook are doing, sort of shift it to the smaller screen because we, that's where we're used to being social. Do you, are you worried that it's going to sort of detract, make all the viewing, the shared viewing happen on a... Not at all. We, so for us, we're, we're pretty agnostic as to where people consume video or discover video. We power, you know, as I was saying before, uh, earlier, we, we power the, the video discovery co uh, content for pretty much every major cable company and satellite company in the US and uh, all of the major CE companies, as well as uh, Google and uh, Walmart.com and Blockbuster.com and Best Buy.com, all these uh, .com experiences. And we don't care where people are looking for content. We know they're going to be looking for content, and, and we're the best place to, to help companies do so. Is that a definite play from Facebook to try and get it onto the more interactive devices? Well, you know, I've, I, I think we've all been, or I've been asked a lot, you know, is this, is this the death of the EPG? And I think that's the, the furthest from the truth because presentation is still really key. What, what are we going to look at in, in the hour that I have on uh, you know, Wednesday night as to what I want to watch? It's just how I decide what I want to watch, which is kind of evolving. And I think in terms of whether that's surface based on somebody that I actually know in my network or based on you know, a thousand reviews of people that are anonymous to me, right? This is, I think, the shift happening in other sectors especially around travel, for instance, right? It used to be that there was no place to get advice for travel. Then it became there was a place to get advice, but everybody was anonymous. And now we're at a point where so much of the reviews are just its volume against kind of our, our, our better senses, and that's why social is having a, such a major impact in those sectors. Same is true for television. But I think the best experiences are those that don't bury that discovery, right? I, you know, it's tabbed experiences and will will allow people to do, you know, to find their friends or kind of on this right hand side. If you look at Spotify, and I think the reason they're so successful is when you're connected within Spotify to Facebook, you see your friends immediately on the right hand side. You don't have to go to a section on Spotify. They're just there. It's just part of the experience. So I think the same is really true for television. It can't be this kind of toe in the water will offer people half and half um, or it, it doesn't really have the the impact and the influence that that can change our viewing habits and increase viewing. Yeah, We've heard a lot about. I was just going to say it's less of the death of the EBG and more of just the evolution of the EBG. And it doesn't matter if it's that square grid that's on your screen or if it's on your iPhone or your tablet or whatever yeah. it is. You still need something to figure out what you want to watch. We've heard a lot about sort of twin screening and the things. It seems like a, you know, a great ideal we're, we're moving to, but still a lot of problems making everything sync up. Presumably, that's where telcos are interested in making it all talk to each other. Yeah, in that and in other things. Uh, I, I'm sorry, not to be, I don't want to be provocative on that, but when Facebook is saying that you see on the right, personally, perhaps I have too, too many friends there, but I don't see anything now. It's, uh, I, I have uh, 20 friends going to the hairdresser. Too 20, much noise. Too much noise. So, uh, so definitely, I was tweeting, to, just to be rude with you, Carla, that uh, it was just like the power company is changing from 50 to 500 hertz without noticing anyone. So uh, 
personally, I will, I will keep some friends. This is the way I'm going to, uh, to act. Uh, but um, yeah, this is, this is crucial. I, I wanted to do a test because um, perhaps people don't measure how it is uh, working, facing this, uh, this uh, tyranny of choice problem. Uh, how many of you have a car? Nobody? You're <laughs> having cycles? OK. Uh, and keep your hands raised if you have a GPS. Okay, seems to be a vast majority. How many of you have a television set? Okay, and how many of you have been reading uh, a paper EPG uh, over the last seven years, seven days? Okay, so it's just that um, driving a car, you know that there are multiple roads and you know that you're going to be lost, so you need the GPS. But more and more people are not reading paper uh, EPG. So it's about finding the right, uh, the right roads, which can come from your friends through social, or which can come through electronic program guide, or all the things which can be done by professional. It's, it's simply about that. I'm going to get onto the money, because all oh. of this stuff costs. Um, from a producer's point of view, there's, you, you're talking about making decisions about which you back. Um, where is all the money in this, or is this just another overhead that we're all going to have to absorb? I think that we may have some elements in the advertising space for sure. This is one idea, but uh, once again, when we first unveiled the, the thing we were doing, the first people to come and see us were the agencies and the, uh, the advertisers saying, OK, maybe there is something we can capture on that and we can bring something on that. Uh, and there is a kind of economics which can be in place with the rewards, the, the, addition, the, the, the additional audience and, and uh, the ads. And the second thing is probably around uh, on the last panel in, on, in the MIP TV, a guy from Endemo was saying that maybe it's the way we should try to think of some new ways of extending some rights. I'm viewing a, a, a fiction, I'm viewing, I'm viewing a, a movie, and I'm just, because I'm viewing that, because I'm checking on this, I can extend the rights for the next 48 hours for two of my friends, which could be a way to. Uh, yeah, you, you will say what you think about that, but it, it could be a way to just to uh, try to, uh, to, uh, to, to fight this tyranny of choice problem. So using the acquisition to then open up new windows to your friends, uh, Why potentially. Not? Um, same question, who's going to pay for all this extra metadata? Uh, the, the metadata kind of pays for itself, because what it does, the, where the money is, is there's a number of new ways to engage with a show. Uh, as you were saying before, it, it actually, in many cases, drives more live viewership, which, in turn, the advertisers are more excited about, because people, uh, it does sort of recreate the water cooler effect of you want to watch it at that moment, either because you don't want the spoilers, or because you want the shared experience around uh, social media, because you, you want to be able to go onto, onto Twitter or whatever at the same time and be able to watch it. At the same time, being able to use multiple devices or have more information about what a user is really interested in helps drive additional advertising opportunities, whether it's on these other screens or whether it's secondary related experiences, et cetera. There's, it opens a ton of new uh, marketing opportunities as well as more targeted marketing. The key that we found, so we do a ton of advertising as well. Uh, we, we power the advertising and the guides for most of our customers. And as long as the advertising is relevant, it's not an ad. It's something people want. It's going back to what I was saying before about how 83% of people don't know what they want. If you have a big ad for uh, a movie that just came out on VOD and that ad is something that that person really wants to watch, they don't look at it as an ad. They can't wait to go watch that trailer and then hopefully go watch that movie. And so it opens up a lot of new opportunities. The key is doing a good job of getting the right stuff in front so, of people. So the assumption being that if you've, if you've got the right viewers and they're engaged, then you've got this extra opportunity to, to actually provide them what they might want from commercial aspects and charge them. Accordingly. Yeah, and it's, not, it's less about the right viewers and getting the right content in front of those okay. viewers. Um, something like Facebook comes along, and the, the threat that everyone worries about is actually the advertising is going to all go to Facebook on the Facebook pages, and none of it's going to go to the, either the content makers or the people <laughs> who are powering the apps. Um. Yes, I think you know what what we've seen you know, kind of happening in the last whatever in kind of six to twelve months is um, you know these content owners kind of experiencing or experimenting with kind of direct to consumer opportunities, and that is a big shift, right? If you look at you know Warner Brothers and um, Universal uh, and Miramax and the way they're kind of experimenting with these new applications that um, that actually are um, you know. Uh, 
revenue driving activities, right? It's paying for content, paying to, to rent content via, via Facebook, but all controlled 100% by them. Um, but I think the, the, the hard part right now is th that shift has kind of happened to saying, actually, we can be a player in this space as well. Um, but the shift of kind of thinking about, but how do we actually fill the funnel um, hasn't really happened yet. Because I think in the past, that was something that we didn't have to worry about, all the people in this room, right? That's what the theaters did. That's what the cinemas did. That was their job. Um, but on Facebook, that's a really different, um, you know, a really different uh, uh, game is trying to figure out exactly how, um, how do you create discovery kind of around that content so that you can actually monetize it. So to me, that's the next kind of thing that we need to figure out together is, um, you know, of course, yes, it is about advertising, um, and that's kind of, you know, a business that we run. But it is about using the right social channels, whether that's um, creating more opportunities for discovery, even though it might feel like a bit of kind of notifications fatigue, as, as, as my, as my uh, uh, fellow uh, like we're represented, but really creating those new points of discovery is so, so important for these um, VOD experiences on Facebook. Otherwise, they just kind of sit there and are, and are undiscovered. So it used to be that you saw a newsfeed story and that led you into experience where you may or may not um, read content. But now that happens also in the ticker real time and happens when timeline comes out um, there. And, and your title is partnerships. Does that suggest there is a sort of a more of a two-way partnership to be had with Facebook? Well, it's, it's, we're a kind of a strange partnerships organization. It's less about kind of deals, and it's more about helping, um, helping the very people in this room just figure out how to actually um, create these experiences in a smart way um, and not recreate a, a kind of on-demand experience on the web inside a Canvas application on Facebook. That doesn't make sense. And I think the early examples of um, kind of social video on-demand um, really were representative of that. They're, they weren't helping to fill the funnel using social channels in the way that um, social cinema apps are doing today. Claire, you've been vocal yesterday about the, the big three giants of Google, yeah. Facebook, and Apple. Are you worried that it's going to squeeze the producers at the end of the day? I don't know that I'm worried that it's going to squeeze the producers. I, I am worried that there is such a dominance of certain players on the internet. Uh, I think it, I mean, in some ways it makes our job easier because we have fewer people to talk to and that's yeah. fantastic. We can go to Facebook, check social media, we can go to, to YouTube, check online video. I mean, you know, YouTube is what, 90% of all online videos viewed in the world? And uh, that's good. It makes, as I said, it makes our life easier. I don't think for the health of, it, of the industry, it's a good thing, frankly. I think it's dangerous, and uh, I, there's nothing I can do about it, of course. But I think eventually, I would like to see more diversity in, in the people in the world because it's not good for them, or it's not good for us. No, you know, lack of competition is never good for an industry. Okay, cool. We're going to open it up to the audience, so if you can, raise your hand if you've got any questions. We've got one over here, if we can get a mic here. Anyone over here for the next, so I can get a mic across. Okay. Hi, thanks. Um, a lot of the talk about social TV is about me being interested in what all my friends are watching or listening to. How far away from people being identified, well, these 10 friends are my music friends, these 10 friends are my TV friends, and we share? Because at the moment, it seems to be to see a big stream of everything, but you might not like the TV that a lot of your friends like. How, how far away is that? Connor? Yeah, I think that's, um, that's a good question. And it, that's already happening more around, um, so music and television being less niche than maybe the, the runs that I do in Hyde Park. But that is happening around um, kind of more niche uh, subject areas. So for example, whether that's cooking, you know, as you can see in the video, or by kind of opening yourself up to these experiences, right? So accepting these experiences as, as an application on your timeline allows you to actually select different groups that you want to see that content. And the same is true on the reverse, right? So I, I, I mean, I don't know how many of you have set up actual groups on your, uh, on, your, on your profile, whether it's your family or colleagues or you know, high school people I never want to see again. And the next time that you go through kind of a, um, an accepting process of an application, you can actually say, I just want my running mates to see what runs I'm doing. And I think right now that in a way, there's two sides to probably the people in this room probably err on the side of, um, we like that level of sophistication. We're all, you know, we understand social networking. We've been on social networks for years now. This level of um, kind of sophistication is great. It's what we've been waiting for. And then there's a whole other group that's kind of like, wow, this, 
this tailoring of my experience is something I still have to really get my head around. But, um, but that's definitely available today, and I think that's um, important for reducing the noise that you have. And in similarly, we, we also make that available uh, to, to most, of the, most of the companies that take recommendations from us uh, uh, are, are able to, we, we sort of parse out recommendations in a number of different verticals. Obviously, there's algorithmic, there's editorial, there's uh, a few, but in the social uh, sphere, there's, there's a couple that are really relevant. One is, of course, here's what all my friends are watching. The second is the notion of sort of uh, the neighborhood of like-minded people and, and finding people with very similar interests and then taking those two buckets and, and combining them in a meaningful way so that it's like, here's what the friends that you care about are, are either friends or people that would be friends if they had similar habits care about uh, and, and that we think are relevant to you. So it, it is already happening. It's just either you're not seeing it or it's really just starting to gain more and more traction. Patrice, you want to come in? Yeah, um, I think we need uh, dedicated uh, places. So uh, I think that... Uh, uh, you don't mean Google places? <laughs> no, no, no. I mean, play, like in, in real life, uh, you can go to a giant department store, but sometimes you need some dedicated places where you know you will have in front of you uh, things that are specific. So as a matter of fact, uh, Facebook is probably the layer, uh, or Google Plus, all these things are the social layer, but you need places, specific places where you know you're going to find uh, things directly and not spending a vast majority of your time thinking of, oh, is this guy relevant for sports? Is he relevant for that? It's okay. So for people who have time, it's perfect. More, more questions looking around? Can't, it's really, there's one over here if we can get a mic over here. And then there's another one further bit back, if we can get Mike to that gentleman afterwards. Uh, hi. Uh, regarding uh, what uh, Ms. Tavernier said before, I'm from uh, Keshet, which is a big broadcaster in Israel. And uh, the experience we, that we have with uh, social media is different uh, from what you experienced. Um, the biggest success we had with social media are with the biggest shows. Uh, shows like Big Brother, MasterChef, and, uh, and Talent Show um, generated a lot of uh, engagement helped the rating, the real-time ratings, and also uh, became uh, online properties that made a lot of money from sponsors and uh, other kind of uh, um, uh, stuff that, that it's really um, mind-blowing to me that you said that X Factor can't can't. Uh no, sorry, I, I, I'm, I, I, that's not what I meant, so sorry, I'll, let me <coughs> re-explain. X Factor can and has become a major power online, both through social media and through its online website, which is enormous, through apps, through, you know, it's, it's a very, very commercially successful digital uh, property for us. So is Idol, especially American Idol, of course, and so is Got Talent. We've made an enormous amount of money, we've engaged with a lot of people, and, but what I'm saying is as an acquisition tool, I don't need it. That's what I'm saying. I, I think those, those, those properties are doing fantastically well and we will continue to exploit them as much as we can. But what we're seeing is the, that social media can be useful in very different ways for smaller shows. And what we, I wouldn't want is that we focus exclusively on the big shows uh, because they're sort of the low hanging fruits and we will continue to do that. But uh, we've, we've had some really interesting successes, especially in the acquisition area with smaller shows. So this, in those big shows, it's about rallying the crowd around a sort of a property and being able to have a conversation or, or bring them to a place where the conversation is happening. You know, for me, in those big shows, it's very much about rewarding the fans. Yeah. You know, I think it's, it's, it's great to be able to do that because they're there and we know that the most vocal fans of the contestants on some of these shows, they, they go through extreme length to support their acts and to support the show. And we've never been in a place where we could really reward them. And I yeah. think now with social media, we're in a much better place to do that. Looking at the niche sh sort of end of the market, mm -hmm. You know, that's obviously a lot harder to connect because you don't know whether there's someone who likes your particular passion for um, Middle Eastern interior decorating and you, there's a show, you know, being able to connect those isn't really happening yet. Or it's, is ha it? it's happening to some extent and it's not happening exactly in the same way as, as you know, the X Factor, which is trending globally on Twitter when yeah. it's on air. That's not what happens with the smaller shows. I think with the smaller shows, we've had really big successes with YouTube as a social platform. And you know, YouTube for me is a social platform through the sharing on, on other platforms, but it's been a very helpful tool and it's a great community tool because people will congregate around videos that they like. 
uh, we've been able to do a lot with Facebook as well, and, and probably less so with Twitter, which tends to be more of a sort of broadcasting. But, but that congregating around niche shows yeah. needs lots of lots of disparate people in those niches, and presumably there are issues then about going across borders because television mm. hasn't caught up with that. Not necessarily. I mean, some sometimes. Yes, but not always. No, you, you, you know, it's, I mean, I would, when I talk about niches, they're not tiny niches. Uh, they're, they're big enough that you, you, can go, you can go locally. But a lot, of our, a lot of our programs have a life across borders. In fact, one of the key things we are discovering is that they have a life across borders. Like the X Factor UK is watched on YouTube across Europe and is very successful there. OK. We're going to bring in that gentleman there. We've got a few more minutes. So if you've got a question. Chim -chim. Got one over here coming. All right. Uh, good afternoon. <laughs> so um, um, I'm from the uh, Middle East, and one of the uh, key issues is ratings, like, uh, and that affects valuation, and that affects production values. So I had this incredible idea yesterday about why not use social media to basically monitor ratings. And when I saw the TV Check app, I was like, wait a minute, can this be transferred into a way for us to be able to monitor ratings? Uh, do you have any comments on that? Uh, and how social media can be used to basically monitor uh, TV viewing and how that can translate into monetization? Um, the shortest answer is yes. The uh, longest one is it's ongoing. Um, I think that um, we've, we've been starting to, uh, to work with, uh, with companies, I, I won't give the name, but you, you're all familiar with them, in order to understand whether uh, all these mechanisms could be uh, uh, used to bring something official I would say, in order to help that. But definitely, uh, this is one of the possibilities. I, I know from when my time at the BBC, there were a couple of uh, commissioners who suddenly got into Twitter, and they could work out the next morning whether their show was going to be a success or not. But bearing in mind that big it's thing, that it's not, a very polarized yeah, graph. <laughs> Yeah. yeah, and it's not representative. I think we have to be very careful of that. Yeah. The social media audience, although it's very important, it's not yet representative of, of the total audience. What we see happening is actually it, it impacting kind of how the format grows and evolves. So not so much about directly about ratings and viewings, but there's a, a format called True Talent. I think it's a Zodiac format in uh, Sweden. And in that show, um, they use the kind of information they have around the, the, the fans on Facebook to help influence how the performances take place in the next week. So what they might share with the performers is, you know, your, your Facebook fans are, you know, they love you in this kind of small town in Sweden, but in Stockholm nobody's, nobody's interested in you. Um, and that's because the, the data is there, it's real, um, it's, it's usable in that way, and it's actually impacting kind of how the show plays out going forward, which is kind of... And, and going back to the economics question, it's funny what you were just talking about with the Twitter feed. We've found that the, the major Hollywood studios are starting to monitor Twitter feeds uh, as uh, leading up to opening day for their movies. And depending on sort of the temperature of the feeds and the comments, they've been adjusting their advertising on some of our platforms right. accordingly, either ramping it up or ramping it down or putting out a, a different type of trailer to appeal to a different audience. So it's actually been quite meaningful in sort of the strategic component for, for studios as they're releasing content. I think it's good to measure impact. It's not yet uh, good to have figures and things you can rely on in, in, understand to, uh, in order to understand volume. But yeah. for impact, this is definitely something. Yeah. Bring in this last question here. We, we are going to have a meet the uh, panelists afterwards. Let's we have this here. gentleman with a moustache. <laughs> we got one with the mic here. Um, right. Jess from New Madrid. Yeah. Um, Claire, I know you're already um, looking into um, credits and things on Facebook and interactive voting, but just on the monetization um, theme, how appealing are things like Facebook credits um, for producers? Can they really? Um, you know, help you monetize, or is the, the fairly high revenue split of putting? No, I wouldn't say that the revenue split is necessarily of putting, it's about having the right product. And we've had a lot of success with Facebook uh, and microtransactions on gaming. And we've had a lot of very, very successful social games based on our uh, game show brands like Price is Right and Family Feud, and they've done incredibly well on Facebook, and they were very profitable. So that we, this is certainly a model that we like, and it's also a model that lends itself very well to VOD and 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 this sort of content. Uh, and of course, voting is another element. I think microtransactions and the fact that there are now some ubiquitous 
billing solutions through Facebook or through iTunes and hopefully sometimes through other people. Uh, you know, the, those are all a very, very positive development for the industry. Sorry, we're going to have to wrap it up there. I'm getting the, the <laughs> time's up sign. Um, join me in thanking Patrice, Sean, Carla and Claire. <laughs> <laughs>